Today we are in this Advent sermon series titled, It's a Wonderful Life. And it's based on the movie. Let me ask you again, how many of you have not ever seen this movie? Oh my goodness gracious. As I have been saying, you are leading a deprived life. You have to see this movie. And I had a person who is an older one. The only reason I'm describing her age to you is because she said to me, I've never watched it, but because of your encouragement, I decided last Saturday that I was going to watch it. And she said to me, I started in, and then all of a sudden, George got angry, and I had to turn it off. <laughs> I said, so you, you just, yeah, I turned it off. And I thought, I don't like violent movies. <laughs> <laughs> so to each their own as the saying goes it's based on this book that you may know about and it is by this Dutchman van der Steen who wrote the book The Greatest Life now have you heard of that quote life is difficult have you heard that quote it's given credit is given to M. Scott Peck but this man, Mr. Van, van der Steen, is the first one to have said that. And he wrote the book, The Greatest Gift, in light of that. He said the reality is life is challenging, life is difficult, and that's why he wrote the book, which eventually became the movie. So here is where we started. Life is wonderful, but sometimes you have to endure it. And I've given you a word every week. Do you remember what the first word was? Gaze. Have you been gazing at beauty, at wonder? I hope so. The second part is life is wonderful. We've got a hope in it. And so what was the word? Oh, you've got to say it like we say it in Montana. You've got to have tenacity. It's almost like Zoe. So tenacity is like a Bulldog. And why do we attribute tenacity to bulldogs? It's the only animal that can latch on and still breathe. That could be a Jeopardy question. <laughs> Part three, life is wonderful. We've got to believe it. This was last Sunday. So what was the word? Miracle. Do you believe in miracles? Do you believe that there is wonder and mystery. The word mystery means speechless. There are things that happen in this life that cannot be explained. To what degree are you open to mystery? How many of you have been to the Loreto Chapel in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico? Have you been there? You know the story. How did that staircase appear? There's a lot of mystery. And some people are just really closed and some people are really open. Where are you on that continuum when it comes to mystery, the things that we cannot explain? Today, we're going to look at how this movie teaches us that life is good and life is wonderful, but we have to learn to trust. We have to trust God. We have to trust others. We have to trust in ourselves. So we're going to watch a clip from the movie where George and Mary are on their way to the honeymoon and they're in the back of the taxi cab and they get interrupted because there's a run on the bank let's watch it together don't look now but there's something funny going on over there at the bank George I've never really seen one but that's got all the earmarks of being a run Now, just remember that this thing isn't as black as it appeared. I have some news for you, folks. I was just talking to old man Potter, and he's guaranteed cash payments to the bank. The bank's going to reopen next week. But, George, I got my money here. Did he guarantee this place? Well, no, Charlie, I didn't even ask him. We don't need Potter over here. And I'll take mine now. No, but you're, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong as if I had the money back in a safe. I, the, the money's not here. 
Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. And in the Kennedy house and Mrs. Maitland's house and, and a hundred others. Uh, you're lending them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I got $242 in here, and $242 isn't going to break anybody. Okay, Tom. All right. Here you are. You sign this. You get your money in 60 days. For 60 days? Well, now, that's what you agreed to when you bought your shares. Tom, Tom. Tom. Did you get your money? No. Well, I did. Old man Potter will pay 50 cents on the dollar for every share you've got. 50 cents on the dollar? Yes, cash. Well, what do you say? No, Tom, you have to stick to your original agreement. Now, give us 60 days on this. Okay, thing. Randall. Are you going to Potter's? Better to get half than nothing. Tom, Tom. Randall, wait a minute. Now, wait. Now, listen. Now, listen to me. I, I beg of you not to do this thing. If Potter gets a hold of this building and alone, there'll never be another decent house built in this town. He's already got charge of the bank, he's got the bus line, he's got the department stores, and now he's after us. Why? Well, it's very simple, because we're cutting in on his business, that's why. And because he wants to keep you living in his slums and paying the kind of rent he decides. Joe, you had one of those Potter houses, didn't you? Well, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten what he charged you for that broken down shack? Here, Ed, you know, you remember last year when things weren't going so well and you couldn't make your payments? Well, you didn't lose your house, did you? You think Potter would have let you keep it? Can't you understand what's happening here? Don't you see what's happening? Potter isn't selling, Potter's buying. And why? Because we're panicky and he's not, that's why. He's picking up some bargain. Now, we, we can get through this thing all right. We, we've got to stick together, though. We've got to have faith in each other. But my husband hasn't worked in over a year, and I need money. How am I going to live until the bank opens? I got doctor bills to pay. I need cash. I can't keep my kids on faith. I've got to have... How much do you need? Hey! I got $2,000. Here's $2,000. This will tide us over to the bank reopens. All right, Tom, how much do you need? $242. Oh, Tom, just enough to tide you over until the bank reopens. I'll take $242. $242. $242. There you are. That'll close my account. Your account's still here. That's a loan. Okay. All right, Ed. Well, I got $300 here, George. All right, now, Ed, what will it take until the bank opens? What, what do you need? Well, I, I suppose... Twenty dollars? Twenty dollars. Now you're talking. Right. Thanks, Ed. That's fine. All right. Now, Miss Thompson, how much do you want? But it's your own money, now, George. Never mind about that. How much do you want well, now? I can get along with twenty, all right. Twenty dollars. Fine. And I'll sign there the paper. You, you don't have to sign anything. I know you. You pay when you can. That's okay. All right, Miss Davis. Miss, well, could I have seventeen <laughs> fifty? <laughs> That's your heart. Of course you can have it. You got 50 cents. <laughs> Seven. We're gonna make it, George. Six. It'll never close us up today. Five, four, three. Two, one, bingo! <laughs> we made it! Cut the door, you sis. We made it. Look, look, we're still in business. We've still got two bucks left. Well, look, let's have some of that. Let's celebrate. Huh? They say that rain on your wedding day is a sign of a blessed marriage. I had so many hopes for that day, and no clue as to how it would turn out. But then, life happens. No matter how many plans you make. And George showed a part of himself that day that I had seen in him all along. That's why I married him. Impossible odds, not knowing what direction to take, yet not giving up on the belief that he had deep in his heart for those that he loved and cared about. As we light this fourth Advent candle, we remember God's promise, a promise you can always trust.
So the word for today is risk. You probably thought I was going to say trust. What's the difference between faith and trust? You can have faith without action. It can be a whole bunch of words or thoughts or feelings, but doesn't necessarily result in action. But it is impossible to have trust without action. You see that in the movie, that George is willing to trust the people. He's inviting the people to trust him. George is having to trust God, but it's not just all this going on inside of his head or inside of his heart. He has to do something. So there's some scriptures today and the fullness of what I have to say you can listen to the 930 service because for the sake of time I'm not going to get into it all but in this passage from Isaiah you have this situation with this character named Ahaz and Ahaz is not willing to trust God to take care of him or to take care of the nation and so God knows us as the scripture says, God knows what's in our heart. So God sends Isaiah. And God sends Isaiah to Ahaz and says, Guess what? Trust me. I'll take care of you. Ahaz basically says, I don't know that I can trust you. Because I'm afraid. And the reason he's afraid is that his nation is under the threat of being invaded. The enemy is right on the border, right there on the border, right there on the very border, ready to come in and take over. And Ahaz is afraid, and the people are afraid. And there's all kinds of chaos. And God knows it and sends the prophet and says, be not afraid. I'll take care of you. I'm just not so sure. I'm just not so sure. I don't know that I can trust you, God. I don't know that this prophet is speaking truth. Meanwhile, the superpower, I'm going to put this in plainer English, okay? For those of you who aren't into history, don't take a nap on me now. Hang with me. This is going to be brief. But the superpower of the region gets on the phone to King Ahaz and says, guess what? You've got somebody right there on the border who wants to come in and take you over. He says, I'm very aware. My people are going crazy. He said, but I'm the superpower. I'll take care of you. And Ahaz has to choose. Am I going to trust God or am I going to trust the Assyrian king who's saying, I'll take care of you? So Ahaz says to the Assyrian king, okay, I'm going to trust you to take care of us. And guess what? The Assyrian king goes to the border and confronts that enemy that is ready to invade King Ahaz's land, Judah, and he takes them out completely. He wipes them out. And then King Ahaz and the king of Assyria decide to have dinner together, and over dinner they form this partnership. They're in tight. And the very next day, the king of Assyria takes over King Ahaz and says you're out I'm in and I'm going to take your people out and I'm only going to keep the people that I can keep under my thumb and they lived under that for several years and the power of this passage we're not going to read it is that King Ahaz had God come in the form of a prophet and speak a word and he couldn't hear it he was too afraid and he wouldn't trust God's plan. And for many, many years, King Ahaz was under the thumb of the king of Assyria. Now, I don't know about you, but I can relate to King Ahaz. I don't like uncertainty. I don't like ambiguity. Do you? I don't like this word, just trust me. It leads to the gospel for the day in that you have the opposite. That's, we've got this 
juxtaposition, if you will. You've got King Ahaz who's not willing to trust and you have Joseph who is. Now let's look at this. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. And when his merry mother had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, you can listen to 930 on all of that. But here's what I want to show you is that Joseph had to trust God's plan in the midst of his fear, in the midst of his anger. That's what I get into in the 930 service, is that Joseph here is full of deep emotion. And one of the things that he has to do is to trust God. God comes to him in the form of an angel and says, this is all of God, trust me. This is of God, trust me. This is of God, trust me. And what does Joseph do? This is a time for interaction. He trusted him. Ahaz said, I don't trust you, God. I don't trust this prophet. I don't trust that you're concerned about us. I don't trust that you're going to take care of us. But he trusted that the king of Assyria would, and he ended up paying the price. But Joseph trusted God. Now, what does that have to do with your life and mine? get onto those other things in the 930 service so you can listen online ruthless trust will always take us into a place where we're out of control it'll always take us into a place where it's obscure where it's uncertain where we are not in control where we are out of our comfort zones however you want to say that have you ever been in that place and how long ago was it See, the message of Advent is that God is calling us to trust and to live life to its full. And one of the reasons why people don't live life to its full is because we always want to play it safe. Right? I do. Do you? And yet, as Brennan Manning says in his book, Ruthless Trust, the splendor of a human heart that trusts God and is loved unconditionally gives God more pleasure than anything on this earth. And yet we as human beings have faith in God, but it's another thing to have trust in God because trust involves action. So I have been fascinated by the story of this medical doctor. She is an orthopedic surgeon, specializes in spine surgery, and her name is Mary Neal. Now, some of you know I have this fascination with near-death experiences. And there's a lot of them that are feel-good stories, and it's not for me to judge whether they happened or not. I think it's great when there's a feel-good story just like everybody else. But I don't trust the feel-good stories unless there's a lot of science behind it. Mary Neal had this experience in 1999 and did not write about it until this year. And the reason, she said, I am not going to write about my experience of being in heaven until I have researched it from every angle of science. Because I'm a scientist. I'm a surgeon. I'm not going to put myself out there unless I know well, guess what happened? She was playing it so safe that she not only had one near-death experience, but it took three. And if you go online and listen to her story, or if you buy her book, which is available now, she tells that God showed up three different times to say, trust me, trust me, trust me. Now, she and her husband are kayakers. If you're a kayaker, listen to this. They went to Chile to, in South America in order to kayak and everything that could have gone wrong did and she ended up under the water for 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes, what happens to a person who's underwater? You die. She goes to heaven. And when she's in heaven, she says, well, first of all, let me tell you that when she was drowning, 
She knew she was drowning. And in that moment, she said, Christ came to her and cradled her. And she said, I know it was Jesus and I know that he was holding me with such tenderness and he was telling me everything will be okay. And he kept saying, trust me, trust me, trust me. And so, the next thing she knows, she's transported by Jesus to the heavenly realm. Now, if you're a scientific kind of person, I especially want to encourage you to read this because you cannot discount her story on the basis of science because she's already gone there. She's in the presence of God and God says to her very clearly, by the way, in the presence of God, she feels such unconditional love she said, I have never felt that kind of love. I've never felt that kind of warmth. I've never felt that kind of wholeness, that kind of peace. She said, I've never been that complete. And she said, the first thing I said to God is, I want to stay here. And God said, you're not. She said, how come? He said, because every person on earth has a particular mission and yours is not over. She said, well, why did I drown then? She, she said to God, I, I want to know the why of this. And God said, trust me. When you read the book, if you want to get it, or if you go online, you, there's all kinds of YouTube videos where she shares her story, and they're all consistent. There is not a flimsy bone in her body. It's, there's not a phony bone either. And she is speaking out of her experience, and God clearly says, your mission is to go back and to spread the message. And the message is this. Until we deal with our fear of death, we will never overcome our fear in life. And she said, God made it crystal clear that every person she meets, she is to say, you have a purpose in life. You have a mission in life. And how do you know if it's over? If you're still breathing, it isn't. And then, Dr. Neal received this word, you are to tell everybody to not be afraid of death. And until they overcome their fear of death, they'll never be able to overcome their fear in life, which means that, as God said to Mary, Neil, people will not move from faith to trust because of fear. And the message that she got from God is to say to as many people as possible, trust me, move from faith to trust and risk do what God has put in you to do. Live life to its full. That's why the word for the day is risk. So she said to God again, why is it that I'm having this experience when you want me to go back? Why don't you just keep me here? It's so wonderful here. And God said again, because you're practicing medicine you're a good doctor, there's only one problem. You don't trust. You don't trust me. You don't trust your family. You don't trust others. You don't even trust yourself. So she's going all over the world with this message. I close with this. Jim Rohn got this right, I think. If you really, if I really want to do something, we'll find a way. But if we don't, we'll find an excuse. Ahaz found an excuse not to trust God. Joseph found a way 
to trust God. Some of you know my spiritual director is a sister of St. Joseph here in town. My former spiritual director, Sister Josephine, died, and so I had to get a new one. But I wanted a sister of St. Joseph because they live this. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer that will prepare us for Holy Communion. I learned this from Sister Josephine. The Josephites, as some call them, the sisters of St. Joseph, pray this every day after the example of Joseph. And if you want to follow my hand actions, you may. And if you don't feel comfortable doing what I'm doing, that's fine. Where God is present, there's freedom. (laughs) But here's how it starts. I thank you, Holy One, for the gift of another day. I reach out in compassion to my sisters and brothers in this world. I offer to you all that I am and all that I have. I open myself to receive the gift that you have waiting for me in this day. That's a big one. And then, may I be united with you throughout this day. That's the prayer of Joseph. That's why he didn't just have faith, he had trust. Because he was willing to act. And to act takes risk are you open if you're able would you please stand as we draw near to the table of grace